Well, it's sort of weird to see cheering there at the closing bell because not a lot of investors are cheering. Welcome to me at the press now. I'm Chuck Todd here in Washington. Yes, that was the closing bell. We're following the breaking news on Wall Street where markets took a massive hit today. Not surprising considering the ugly economic data that came out this morning. Inflation is still red hot. There's been no slowing down, as some had hoped in the Biden White House. Gas prices are soaring. The recession fears are now rising. Stocks dropped after the inflation report showed a much faster than expected rise in prices. We thought there was going to be a slowdown. President Biden is trying to tamp down those recession fears. He addressed the issue of inflation this afternoon at the Port of Los Angeles, trying to blame the war in Ukraine for this issue while vowing his own action. Today, I'd like to speak about my top economic priority, fighting inflation. I understand Americans are anxious, and they're anxious for good reason. I was raised in a household when the price of gasoline rose precipitously. It was the discussion at the table. It made a difference when food prices went up. I'm doing everything in my power to blunt Putin's price hike and bring down the cost of gas and food. So we're standing by for some additional remarks from the president any moment now as he attends the Summit of Americas in Los Angeles, a summit that the United States is hoping will keep a close eye on what he has to say and bring you the most important parts. All of this comes as we are also tracking the fallout from those remarkable primetime hearings last night by the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. The committee appears to be assembling everything it would need to make a criminal referral to the Justice Department to potentially prosecute former President Trump. We'll have much more on that in just a moment, but let's get a little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, nuance here and context on what happened today on the market. This stock slump, we're joined by CNBC's senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani. And Bob, when this stuff happens and happens on a Friday, a lot of times Fridays are a way of forcing investors to overreact. So you look at a big number like this, it's going to sit with people. Is this an overreaction today by the markets or is something worse coming? Uh, hi, Chuck. No, it is not uh, an overreaction. Un unfortunately, Inflation isn't moderating, and the stock market is terrified that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to keep raising interest rates to combat inflation. This is one of its two core jobs, to combat inflation. Inflation is a bit out of control for whatever reason, whether it's COVID, supply chain issues, what's going on in the war in Russia and Ukraine. There are multiple causes for why inflation is a bit out of control, but it's not moderating. It's not going down. The stock market had been hopeful. Maybe it'll start slowing down, and then the Federal Reserve, sometime in the back half of the year, they'll stop raising interest rates. That hope was kind of dashed today. And so the problem is the stock market has a long history of dealing with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve tends to overshoot during times of mm -hmm. high inflation. To slow inflation down, they raise interest rates too much, and then the economy goes into a recession. They were hopeful we'd get this soft landing, and it's looking like the Fed's going to have to get really aggressive, and now the chances of a recession have increased. That's why the market's down so much today. Look, Bob, there, there, I, I, has it already been built in the three half-point raises that essentially Chairman uh, Powell had signaled, and this is now the market fearing that it's no longer going to be half points, that it might be full, maybe three quarters or full points, and, and may come more frequently? Well, up until yesterday, the market had been rallying off the lows a few weeks ago. It's up about was up about 10 percent on the hope that we would, in fact, see a moderation. So the market was expecting a half a point raise in, in June. That's next week. Half a point raise in July. And some were expecting half a point again in September, but others were saying, no, inflation is mm -hmm. moderating. Now we know that's not happening. So, yes, there are even people who think that they may try to raise three quarters of a point, 75 right. basis points uh, next week when they meet. So that's changed a lot in the last 24 hours. So next week you expect to be another volatile week while everybody tries to read the Fed's tea leaves? Yes. The problem now is if we if the market starts believing that the Fed's going to overshoot, they're going to have to keep raising rates and throw it into a recession. That means the earnings for these corporations, that's what moves the stock prices is the expectations for earnings. Right. The earnings are going to be lower because the economy is going to be a lot weaker. That's really what people are worried about now. Well, what is it? Jamie Dimon said a hurricane is coming. Uh, I guess today is the uh, is the hurricane warning flags are now up, huh? 
Fair to say. Yeah, the Diamond actually said it could be a modest hurricane or a more serious hurricane. What the market is saying today now is they're a little more worried that it could be a more serious hurricane. There's, there's a soft landing still possible. They may still be able to just kind of gently yeah. slow down the economy and not throw it into a recession. That's what everybody wants. We still have that low unemployment rate, which is helping perhaps give us that soft landing if it's possible. That's Bob Pisani, really appreciate you coming on, providing your expertise okay. for us. Thank you, sir. Let's turn now to the January 6th committee hearing. It is clear after last night that this is the most complete investigation of Donald Trump we've ever seen. So now what? Last night, the January 6th Select Committee began to release its findings. In prime time, the committee demonstrated it has the receipts. More than 1,000 interviews, 140,000 documents, and they say they're going to lay out a damning portrait of the former president's role in the attack on the Capitol, along with his efforts to overturn the will of the people by subverting the results of the free and fair 2020 election. January 6th was the culmination of an attempted coup, a brazen attempt, as one rioter put it shortly after January 6th, to overthrow the government. On the morning of January 6th, President Donald Trump's intention was to remain President of the United States, despite the lawful outcome of the 2020 election and in violation of his constitutional obligation to relinquish power. Over multiple months, Donald Trump oversaw and coordinated a sophisticated seven-part plan to overturn the presidential election and prevent the transfer of presidential power. In our hearings, you will see evidence of each element of this plan. Throughout last night's opening statements, the committee used depositions from witnesses in Trump's inner circle to showcase, both in audio and visual, how the former president was repeatedly told that he'd lost, fair and square, actually that he was going to lose uh, pre-election as well. And yet he continued to spread the false information, stirring up those diehard supporters. I was in the Oval Office, um, and... At some point in the conversation, Matt Oskowski, who is the lead data person, was brought on. And I remember he delivered to the president pretty blunt terms uh, that he was going to lose. I remember a call with uh, Mr. Meadows, where Mr. Meadows was asking me what I was finding and if I was finding anything. And I remember sharing with him that we weren't finding anything that would be sufficient to um, change the results in any of the key states. I saw absolutely zero basis for the allegations. I told them that it was that it was uh, crazy stuff, and they were wasting their time on that, and uh, it was doing a great grave disservice to the country. How did that affect your perspective about the election when Attorney General Barr made that statement? It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said, was saying. Of course, some of those diehard supporters, fueled by former President Trump's words, ultimately led the attack on the Capitol. The committee says the president refused to call on the mob to leave and gave no order to defend the Capitol. The committee also released new video footage of the riot. And nearly a year and a half later, these images continue to be very hard to watch. Five to 50 be advised, uh, Cal Police One advised they're trying to breach and get into the Capitol. The doors barricade. There's people flooded the hallways outside. We have no way out. Folks, as New York Times' White House correspondent Peter Baker put it this morning, in the entire 246 year history of the United States, there was surely never a more damning indictment presented against an American president. The case against Donald J. Trump described not just a rogue president, but a would be autocrat willing to shred the Constitution to hang on to power at all costs. So the question now is, what are the consequences going to be, both legally and politically? Legally, the committee certainly seems to be laying the groundwork to send a criminal referral to the Justice Department, which would put the potential prosecution of the former president in the hands of the current Attorney General, Merrick Garland. What he decides to do or not do will be historic no matter what. As for the political consequences, that's up to the public and the voters, and whether our democracy is healthy enough to hold to account a man who had fueled a coup attempt in an effort to cling to power or not. Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill for us. With me on set are Justice Correspondent Pete Williams, Punchbowl News founder Jake Sherman, 
and also an NBC News contributor. And also with us is Jay Johnson, former DHS secretary under President Obama, former assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. And it's those legal chops uh, that we want to exercise there with Mr. Johnson. But let me start on Capitol Hill. Ali Vitale. And I want to start because we have a little update today. There was a lot of sort of many little bombshell scoops. Uh, one of the most intriguing was the Scott Perry pardon accusation that he requested one. In fact, I think uh, Andy Biggs may be another one in here. Um, it's my understanding Congressman Perry has responded. Where's the, who, who is, where's the evidence that he did do it and what is the response? Well, they're not giving any of the evidence that it didn't happen, but they are denying this allegation from the January 6th Select Committee. You're right that this is the second sitting Republican lawmaker who we've heard of from the committee who says that they have witnessed testimony that Perry and, and Andy Biggs both asked for presidential pardons, which of course begs the open question, why do you need a pardon if you don't think that you're doing something illegal? I think that's going to be one of the key pieces, as you said in your introduction, about what happens legally in terms of of accountability and ramifications. Certainly when you have sitting lawmakers asking for presidential pardons, and certainly this is something the committee is going to further tease out, what, what does accountability look like and does the Department of Justice play a hand in that? And then I think the other piece of it too, we watched them spend a lot of time and resources laying out that Donald Trump's mindset was that he knew he lost the election and pursued these false avenues to defraud the electorate anyway. I'm not a lawyer, I'm glad there are lawyers on this panel because it does seem like that's the goal of the committee, which is to convince the public of the former president's mindset right. using the words of his own allies. And I think the open question to lawmakers and the one that I've been asking too is what happens if you get what you want? What happens if you convince the American public that Donald Trump has an accountability role to play here and the Department of Justice doesn't pursue yeah. that? Where does this go next? And I think that's one of the key questions as these hearings continue. Look, the other uh, big uh, uh, sort of um, unveiling was another confirmation of sort of President Trump's lack of empathy for what was taking place and the threats against Mike Pence. Let me play how uh, Vice Chair Cheney laid it out. You will hear testimony that, quote, the president did not really want to put anything out calling off the riot or asking his supporters to leave. You will hear that President Trump was yelling and, quote, really angry at advisors who told him he needed to be doing something more. And aware of the rioters' chance to hang Mike Pence, the president responded with this sentiment, quote, maybe our supporters have the right idea. Mike Pence, quote, deserves it. You know, Jake Sherman, I have to tell you, if when I think about the potential political fallout from this, I want to wait to see when they lay out the Mike Pence story, how, how Republican elected officials handle it, and whether that, this is not about whether this is politically helpful, in the, in the, it's about whether the, a separation of Donald Trump now has to be made, because look what he did to Mike Pence. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the main retort has been, well, this we don't have to focus on this because unemployment is is because inflation is high and the economic condition is worsening and people don't care about this. But two things can be true. The economic situation in the country is bad, mm -hmm. but there was also an insurrection at the Capitol. Yeah. And and uh, that doesn't absolve um, that kind of broad economic unease doesn't make it that Republicans don't have to answer to this. I mean, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, Lee Stefanik, the House Republican leadership has not answered to any of these claims and has not been forced to yet. They're out of town today. What will be really interesting to me in the coming days is the split between Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, because yeah. Mitch McConnell has been supportive of the January 6th committee, or at least has said lightly, he's, he's very interested to see what it comes yeah. up with, where he, McCarthy said he's not watching it, it's a sham. Yeah, no, there's definitely a trash. P. Williams, Look, this is, I, I have a feeling this is going to land in, on your beat's lap. Um, but the Justice Department has their own investigation going on. But is Donald Trump the one being investigated? Well, the simple answer to that question is we don't know. What we do know is that people around him are being investigated. What we can be most certain of is that the Justice Department began by looking at these efforts in the seven battleground states to have Trump electors send their electoral tallies into the National Archives as though uh, Trump had won the popular vote in those states, which he didn't. 
And so the question is, is that fraud, is there some violation of the federal law there? And we know the Justice Department is looking into that. In fact, some state officials are looking into that as well. And we also know from subpoenas that have been issued that the Justice Department is looking at people around the president. Whether they're investigating him or not at this point, we simply don't know. Jay Johnson, you were saying earlier um, that you thought uh, this was starting to look like uh, something that could be prosecuted. You were, you were a U.S. attorney, uh, assistant U.S. attorney, uh, and uh, not just any place, S SDNY, right? The, uh, the sovereign uh, district of New York, uh, as it's called. Uh, one of my staffers called last night a speaking indictment. Is he on to something? Yes. Um, by the way, uh, I was a prosecutor over 30 years ago, hired by guess who? Rudy Giuliani in 1988. Um, what struck me about last night's hearing, the opening statements of the, the chair and the vice chair, they were not shy. And they, they're privy to all the evidence. We got a glimpse of it last night, but they're privy to all the evidence. And they all but said that Donald Trump is guilty of being involved in an effort at a coup to overthrow our government. Um, I thought it was significant that they seemed to be building a case uh, that he somehow joined the uh, seditious conspiracy, that he may be guilty of violating the insurrection statute. Right. The insurrection statute punishes insurrection, but it also punishes those who give aid and comfort thereto. And then there was the use of the word fraud. Uh, wire fraud is a, is a tool uh, very familiar to federal prosecutors. Mail and wire fraud is punishable. It's a felony. Essentially, it criminalizes false statements uh, in pursuit of achieving a goal. And so I, I, the way I, it, last night sounded very much like the opening statement of a federal prosecutor at a federal criminal trial. Mm -hmm. I suspect when this is all over, the real Department of Justice is going to be under huge pressure to do something with this evidence. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Look, it does seem as if there are going to be multiple things that they attempt, and it seems like the, the weaker case is going to be connecting him to the attack on the Capitol itself. But boy, did they make a compelling case for it. Listen to this sort of uh, uh, case they made that, that essentially President Trump's debate comments about the Proud Boys ended up as a recruiting tool. Proud Boys, Boys, stand back and stand by. Uh, after he made this comment, Enrique Terrio, then chairman of the Proud Boys, said on Parler, standing by, sir. During our investigation, we learned that this comment during the presidential debate actually led to an increase in membership from the Proud Boys. Would you say that Proud Boys numbers increased after the stand back, stand by comment? Exponentially. I'd say tripled, probably. So, Pete, I want to bring this back to you. The, the currently, right now, a lot of these Proud Boys and, and Oath Keepers are, are, are either in the system, have been prosecuted, or are still being investigated. Or have pleaded in, guilty and agreed to cooperate with the government. Which also may be here. I mean, trying to put the president connected to that, uh, that to me seems to be the, the, the tallest hurdle that this committee has to clear. Yes, and, you know, Liz Cheney said an interesting thing last night. She said the committee knows that there was a plan to invade the Capitol. Now, perhaps the committee has that evidence. The government has yet to allege that in any of the charges against the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or anybody else who took part in the rioting. Certainly that there was planning to do something at the Capitol to, you know, storm the Capitol, be around it. Mm -hmm. But there's never been an allegation in any of the indictments so far that there was a plan in advance to go into the Capitol and try to stop the vote counting. So I think that's going to be something interesting to watch to see if the committee has developed such information. It'll be interesting right. to see to me if who of those folks, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, mm -hmm. were in touch with the White House. I mean, I think that is going to be really fascinating because that's been, Benny Thompson has now said that. By the way, footnote, you know, the meeting between the leader of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers happened in the parking garage of this building. Oh, I, <laughs> not a footnote as far as my family is concerned, for what it's worth. Uh, that is not a footnote. That is a, a, a nervous bug. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, Chuck, I have to. I'm putting my Homeland Security hat back on. Yeah, I remember well the moment after that presidential debate was over, uh, thinking we have just raised the prominence of the Proud Boys uh, by by a multiplier, mm -hmm. by the fact that 
they were referenced constantly throughout that debate. So I'm not surprised that membership soared right after that debate was over. Hey, Ali Vitale, you've been trolling Capitol Hill a little bit today. I know it's also one of those days where a bunch of people have left town. Yeah, but have you, got, have you gotten any Republican reaction that, you know, the typical reaction we get when, well, don't quote me my name, but let me tell you what I really think. I have not yet gotten that, but they're not here. And, and while we've been texting, I do think that Jake kind of hits the nail on the head here, though, in terms of both chambers having varying degrees of reactions here, right? There are more senators that I have talked to on the Republican side of this who are willing to watch, who are willing to engage, who are actively interested in what the committee might find versus people in the House that are playing by a very different permission structure based on what their base is telling them at home. I do, though, want to pick up on one of the threads when you talk about the overlap between DOJ and the Oath Keepers investigations. One of the things that the January 6th committee put out in a letter to one of these sitting Republican lawmakers was about Ronnie Jackson asking him why those same far-right groups would be saying that on January 6th they need to protect him because he has information to protect, asking where he was on January 6th. All of these pieces of overlap as they relate to sitting Republican lawmakers eventually are going to bear fruit. I think Jake made this point in Punchbowl this morning saying that it's it's going to be a long month for Republican lawmakers. I think that's true, but it's going to be longer for some than others. Jay Johnson, uh, you put yourself in Merrick Garland's shoes. You're, you're, you're likely going to not get one, but multiple criminal referrals here. Uh, and maybe you want multiple referrals so that way you, you, your, your compromise is you pick one and you go. Um, what it, describe what you think the process DOJ is going to go through, assuming they do get a referral from this committee. Well, at the very least, the attorney general is going to have to have an explanation as to what he is doing with any referral. I suspect that the team that is currently prosecuting the January 6th defendants will want to see every piece of evidence uh, that comes out of the committee, and they'll, they'll make their own independent judgment. But as I noted before, uh, they're going to be under considerable yeah. political pressure, if you will, uh, to take some form of action. And Chuck, I have to say one more thing uh, from last night. I, I was impressed very much by, by Caroline Edwards. Yeah. You know, every person who becomes a federal employee takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But very few of us actually do something in our federal service to actually accomplish that. Uh, this is somebody who literally put her body and soul on the line to protect a constitutional process. And I think that is highly, highly noteworthy. She and her Capitol Police colleagues. She, uh, she brought everything back to life on January 6th in a way for a lot of us, um, a lot of people. And Jake, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you felt that way. I know Garrett felt that way. It was like it just brought everything back again uh, in real time. Um, Pete Williams, I know you have something you want to add on, the, on how Mark Garland might add this, but one thing I've been surprised, why isn't there a special counsel? Well, because I think the Justice Department feels they're qualified to do this. And, you know, they always resist the special counsel thing. They always say, look, this is our job. This is, this is, this is what we're it, supposed to do. They resist it, but they always get appointed. And, they get appointed and, and they're not being asked to investigate this administration. That's right. when you often hear the call for a special Fair counsel. Enough. The other point I wanted to make is just on the referral issue. I think the committee has to decide whether to make a referral because that cuts both ways. If the if the committee that's been branded as so democratically and aligned sends a referral to the Justice Department, then the Justice Department has to say, well, if we agree, then why are we going to? That sort of complicates the political calculus. That, that's interesting. Ali Vitali, give us a preview Monday. Who do who are the big testifiers? Yeah, look, we're going to be getting into, according to the committee, the idea of the big lie. Back to that idea of the motive of Donald Trump, knowing that he already lost and then still pursuing these avenues to overturn the election results anyway. We're going to hear, for example, from one former Fox News editor, Chris Steyerwalt, who's going to have that testimony. More witnesses to come, but certainly we're seeing them put the puzzle pieces together starting next week and continuing into the following one, too. All right. Ali Vitale, Pete Williams, Jake Sherman, and Jay Johnson terrific way to help break everything down last night. Thank you all. Coming up, we're going to have more reaction to last night's hearing. We're going to speak with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who was in the hearing room last night and inside the House chamber when the insurrectionists breached the Capitol on January 6th. She joins me on set next. And later, Putin's imperial ambitions. Putin the Great 
why the 21st century Russian president invoked an 18th century czar, and what it means for Russia's future, Ukraine's future, and NATO's future. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As the January 6th committee presented its findings to the American public, some members of Congress who were inside the Capitol on that uh, nearly deadly day uh, were listening in the room. Among them was Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who last January found herself seeking shelter in the House gallery as rioters attempted to enter the chamber. And it was clearly important to the Congresswoman to be there last night for the first night of the hearings. Congresswoman Jayapal is here. Um, Reliving them, I can't imagine, especially, I want to start with hearing Officer Edwards yeah. and what that was, how did you handle that and what was yeah. it like to hear all that? I thought it was one of the most powerful moments of the evening, um, you know, when she described particularly that she was not combat trained, that she was trained to detain a couple of people, to manage crowds, but she was not combat trained, and then described the detail of, you know, slipping in people's blood and catching people as they fall. And, you know, right, bef right after the break, um, I actually, or maybe it was right before the break, I actually saw Harry Dunn and some of the other officers, and we hugged and we were all crying. I mean, look, it was a very emotional day because it was reliving everything. And it wasn't just our lives that we feared for. Mm -hmm. It was really the shock all over again of this is happening in our capital. This is happening in the seat of the greatest democracy in the world, and this is how close we came to losing our democracy. So I, I think it was important that we were there. I went with, um, uh, you know, we had, I started a group called the Gallery Group right after January 6th. We mm -hmm. were all trapped in the gallery. Um, we couldn't get out. And um, uh, even when other members were evacuated from the floor, we were still there. And To remind people, by the way, that was due to COVID protocols. Not everybody could be on the floor. I think some people may forget why some yes. of you were separated out and why there were, you know, and it, which actually made it, more, all of you guys, more of a target. That's right. Yeah. And actually, not all of Congress was on either the floor or the gallery. Right. We were supposed to be going in shifts. So we were in the first shift that was there, but we were up in the gallery. And um, we have, you know, each given each other a lot of comfort over this last 16 mm -hmm. months. But it was important for us to be there. And for a lot of people, it felt like the beginning of, um, you know, getting to closure, right? Because it wasn't just about the day. It was all the facts that led up to the day. It was connecting the dots, putting all the puzzle pieces in mm -hmm. place. Listening to Bill Barr was the other big moment for me because, of course, I've battled with, big, uh, with Bill Barr on a lot of things. But listening to Bill Barr say... Uh, you know, that, that very this bluntly, was, very <laughs> bluntly. I won't say it on. on no, we, on we've agreed. We carried it live once and we're beeping it out every other time, unfortunately. <laughs> so I think that was, you know, it was important for all of us, I think, to be there. You think you're going to, you know, it's, it, it's, do you think you're going to get justice? I think we have to. I don't, I don't think it's an option, Chuck, because here's the thing. This was about overturning the election, stealing the election. And um, by a sitting president, mm -hmm. the, the committee was very clear. They put Donald Trump at the center of this conspiracy to stay in power despite what everybody out there who's watching said in their ballot. And um, to me, if we don't get justice, then we can't guarantee our democracy. What does justice look like? To me, it is that Trump is, uh, and look, I got to see the rest of the, the testimony. But if it's what was laid out by Liz Cheney and, and uh, Benny Thompson yesterday, then it is indicting Donald Trump um, and making sure that he is also never going to hold public office again. It is all of the people that were a part of it, including apparently some of my fellow members of Congress on the other side. Um, and then, of course, the insurrectionists, the people that were part of the mob, we have already seen some of that happening. But I think the Department of Justice needs to act quickly on this because... This is not political, and that's why, you know, Liz Cheney was uh, a, a big star last night. Mm -hmm. um, I have a tremendous amount of admiration for her courage, even though our policies are nowhere near each sure. other. But she puts party, uh, she puts country over party. And she did that last night very clearly. And I think we, um, you know, I think we are going to have to make sure that um, everybody who was a part of this yeah. is held accountable. Uh if you were to parse, I mean, this, it, it feels to me they were laying out almost two cases. One is the 
it, to me, is a very, uh, uh, a very strong case that he orchestrated the overturning of the election. Yeah. I think the tougher case to make is his incitement of, of the actual attack on the Capitol. Um, what more evidence do you think is going to be necessary to, to pin that part of them on him? Well, Benny Thompson gave a little bit of a preview to that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the connections between the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and the White House is going to be very, very important. And I think it sounds like there is real testimony around that. Um, I wish we had uh, Mark Meadows uh, testifying as well, because I think there's very important information that he had from the White House. We're getting it from some other people. But um, the the intent to cause violence is tied, I believe, to the inaction of the president to mm -hmm. stop violence. And so I think that's going, you know, we're already seeing that testimony from General Milley. Mm -hmm. I mean, so these people were all part of the Trump cabinet, for Pete's sake. This is not or me. We're appointed by Trump. Um, I think General Milley. Not a, uh, right, not, uh, yeah, not, not that's not a, right. right. Good, good correction. Yeah. Um, and I, but I think these were all oh, part of Trump's. Oh, I think he's sensitive to that. That's why, to be fair. <laughs> right. The right. It's, it's, it's appropriate. Um, but these were all part of that administration, and mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we recognize that those are the voices we're hearing, but there are a lot of other voices that are not there, including some of my colleagues who should be testifying and who apparently were asking for presidential pardons. You've got to wonder what they did that they were asking for presidential pardons. There have been four federal investigations of Donald Trump essentially since he's been president, due to yeah. his presidency in some form or another. And the first three cases, while it appeared to be strong, were, were hamstrung by lack of receipts, lack of cooperation. I mean, shoot, yeah. the first one was just, it ended up an obstruction case because they didn't actually get cooperation. This one has the most receipts, and it feels like accountability is the hardest to get. Well, it's probably the, I mean, it's the hardest to get maybe because this is so big. Yeah. I mean, what we're talking about, and that's why I thought it was appropriate that they went back in history. Um, at the beginning of the hearing because this is of that scale. Mm -hmm. And so it, it will be hard. Um, there's no question. There's, it, you know, charging, indicting, holding accountable a, f a, a, s a former president of mm -hmm. the United States for his role in an attempted coup um, is not going to be easy. But it is impossible, in my belief, to move on um, or to know that this won't happen again unless we do. Can you say we're a healthy democracy if we're not capable of at least attempting uh, accountability? No. I really, I really think we can't. And I'll tell you, I don't think we are a healthy democracy right now. I think we have not gotten to that place where we um, have the assurance mm -hmm. that democracy will always prevail. We saw it. I saw it, Chuck. I mean, I am um, reliving uh, that. You would never have known it was 18 months ago. I mean, I didn't for, feel like, for, honestly, I lost the day of the week again. It's like, yes. oh, I'm living, it's, it yes. is. I think we're all living here January 6th again. Yes. And it does feel like, felt, felt very recent again. Exactly. Now, half the country might not have tuned in. It's true, but I think a lot of people did tune in. A mm -hmm. lot of people will tune in. Um, I think the voices are very important. I think Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are very important to this. Um, Bill Barr on camera is important. Ivanka Trump on camera's report. That's, that's right. That, to me, is what made this yes. different Those from the, the impeachments. I think that's right. Those were the moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, we, we also didn't have a committee during the impeachments. Uh, we didn't have Republicans and Democrats working together in the way that this was or the way that the 9-11 Commission was. Pramila Jayapal, thank you for coming on. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Up next, a heated gun debate rages on, and the January 6th Committee's opening night moves witnesses to tears. After a week of gripping congressional testimonies, where do both parties go from here? My panel joins me next on what if the political fallout could look like. You're watching Meet the Press now. It's important to the American people to understand what truly happened and to understand that the same forces that led January 6th to remain at work today. If we can unite and defend this nation, Democrat and Republican, allow no one to place a, da a dagger at the throat of our democracy. That's what those hearings are all about. Welcome back. That was President Biden this afternoon addressing last night's hearing during remarks that were billed as focusing on inflation and supply chain challenges. For more on what does all this mean in the long run and how Democrats and Republicans should or could respond, I'm joined by Danielle. Danielle Gibbs-Leger, 
former special assistant to the president in the Obama administration, and Sarah Fagan, Republican strategist and former White House political director in the George W. Bush administration. And let me put up what the counter messaging was. This is Jim Banks, House Republican from Indiana earlier today. Well, that, that's why we say this is a cover-up. This committee is a cover-up. It's, it's not just a, a cover-up from distracting from the issues that the American people are demanding that we focus on, like $5.25 a gallon of gas in my hometown in Columbia City, Indiana. All right, here's what I'm not wanting to make this conversation about, about whether January 6th is going to impact the midterm elections. I don't, to me, the political fallout is, what does this mean for the Republican Party's relationship to Donald Trump? Sarah Fagan, let me start with you. Well, I think it sort of depends what happens, you know, in the aftermath of these hearings. You know, at, at present time, I don't think it means much. I don't think much is going to change because the, the cake is baked. The, his supporters have decided, mm -hmm. based in part on what he and others have said, that this is just a, a hoax or a cover-up and that there's no there there. Mm -hmm. And so the cake is baked. So I don't, unless something dramatic happens where... You know, he actually is referred to the Justice Department, right. you know, or is found, you know, guilty of some crime, the Sedition Act or right. something. I don't think much will change. Danielle? Um, I think you're right. I think it depends on what happens and what mm -hmm. comes out. You know, it, they teased last night that there's going to be a lot more that we don't know. Pence that, night, that, really. The Pence day yeah. is what I'm curious what the reaction is going to be after that's out. But we got to see it all. Right, exactly. And I would, you know, still posit that even though there may be a, a shift between Donald Trump and Republicans, I, mm -hmm. Donald Trump has become the Republican Party, if that makes a sense. So the things that he espouses, the things that he does, even if they kind of do this to him, yeah. it's it's too late, I think, for the Republican Party to say that, all right, well, we're not like Donald Trump anymore it's, over the last couple it, of years. The, no, the, gonna, the irony, so the, so the irony, I think, is there's, you know, certainly there's very strong Trump support in the party, and I don't think that's likely to change. I suspect most of But it the, could become deeper and narrower, right? It could become deeper and narrower. I suspect what we heard yesterday, what, those were the highlight clips. Right. So, I mean, perhaps there's big news coming I suspect there's not. We'll see. Um, you don't think the pet, what, I, I'm just curious. Like, I, when, when they lay out everything he said about Mike Pence and the threats against Mike Pence, look, it's good. It moves Liz Cheney. We know that. Yeah. It moves Mitch McConnell. There's a certain group sure. of people that it, does. It moves Do old-line Republicans, it, right? Well, does it move just a, is it like a, watching erosion on a riverbed? You don't see it, obviously, but then all of a sudden, after three months, you're like, oh, wow, there, look at that. I, like, I, is there a line that's finally been crossed? Yes. I, I, there have been, we've had that conversation I know. so many times, sure. no matter what, no matter what so line true. is crossed, it, it has not ultimately changed anything relative to Trump and the Republican Party. At least this big element. I think you're right. Like, perhaps that's the most likely path, is it's a deeper, slightly more narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means in a presidential contest where there's 15 people on a stage, like, I, a, lo a lot, you know, has to play out here you, in the party. But I, I think that, look, Nancy Pelosi made a huge mistake when she rejected Kevin McCarthy's picks. You, you may not like them. You may think that that they would be disruptive to the process, mm -hmm. but it would have been better to have that counter narrative in this hearing for them to debunk if, if in fact- If you also had Liz Cheney yes. on there? If you also had Liz yeah. Cheney on there. But, they, um, but it's not like he couldn't have appointed other people, right? He chose like not those, to go find two others. Exactly, those two. He, 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 she wouldn't have rejected Elise Stefanik. Right. Unclear. I mean, perhaps not, but it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. He should have had a say in that. And, yeah. and the Mitch McConnell is the one though that shut down the big commission. Is that like we could add Condi Rice and Tom Daschle? Right, could have totally right. taken out of Congress, mm -hmm. which arguably would have been better for the country. But you know where we are today is that there is a Democrat, mm -hmm. fully Democrat-controlled yeah. committee hearing with you know the leaders' you know choices rejected. I had a very uh, savvy and sometimes cynical uh, Republican operative in Florida say to me, "These hearings are great for Ron DeSantis," meaning. It just meaning that either it takes Trump down mm -hmm. and he's the guy, or it just makes everybody uncomfortable with Trump and he's the guy. That it's a well, it's a win win for him. Well, look politically. One of the ironies of this process is that th there's also a sliver of Republicans who are, who would sort of love to see Trump go away based on right. this, and some of those people stand at podiums and say nice things about Donald Trump. Uh, so I I just don't suspect we're going to see much more. 
what we've seen is damning, it's damning. What we saw that day in the was Capitol damning too. was damning. It was very damning. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've heard most of these quotes already. Daniela, Merrick Garland. <laughs> um, I heard it from Congresswoman Jayapal. It was sort of like, oh, he better take it and he better take it fast. Look, we're not saying it's a given yet that there's going to be a criminal referral. Pete Williams said, you know, that's a, that's a tough decision. It sound, looks to me they're moving in that direction. Liz Cheney is the one that introduced the thought that that could be what happens here. Um, the pressure on Merrick Garland politically, particularly from the party. I think it's a lot, but he strikes me as a type of person who does not bend to outside pressure, mm -hmm. and he's going to do what he thinks is right. And it may anger a whole lot of people on the left in the country uh, if they think they're moving too slowly, but I think what you're going to see, what Liz Cheney laid out yesterday, uh, is a clear case that some people mm -hmm. are going to get referred for criminal prosecution. Whether it goes to Donald Trump, we'll see what happens. But Merrick Garland doesn't strike me as the type of person to bend to political pressure. There's... A Let's say there is more evidence and Donald Trump is referred to the Justice Department, which, based on what I've seen thus far, it seems unlikely to me. Um, however, like, what a terrible situation for the Biden administration. So, so there's a re-election two years away, and the Justice Department, you know, led by a Democratic AG, is going to be, you know, building a case against the potential candidate for the Republican nomination. I mean, there, there's no win in that politically for Democrats. No, there, there may not be. But like, is this about more than politics? Mm -hmm. This is about our country. This is about our democracy. Mm -hmm. If there is evidence that Donald Trump actually had a hand in trying to subvert the mm -hmm. willful transfer of power, that's bigger than mm -hmm. Joe Biden. That's bigger than all of us. That's that's our country. That's our democracy. Mm -hmm. Do either do you believe January 6th will be in closing ads in a midterm election campaign anywhere? Uh, if it's not, I would be upset about that. You think it should be part of the larger story, yeah. larger narrative that yes. the party says? Yes, it should be, because yeah. there's one party who's fighting to protect a the democracy. There's one party who's fighting for the American people. If I was writing those ads, I would be including the Senate. Do you expect any Republicans, Sarah, to try to find a way to um, be a little more critical of his behavior while still trying to be supportive of it? Like, do you expect that to become, do you, do you see more of them coming out or not? Uh, I mean, I think people should be critical of his behavior. His behavior was not appropriate. You know, even if he didn't tell people to charge, and, and there's no evidence to suggest he was yeah. encouraging them to damage the Capitol, he should have done something about it when it was happening. Um, you know, I, I suspect people will be critical depending on what is laid out, but they'll go back pretty quickly to looking for his fundraising and his endorsement. Look, I, I probably overspot. Mm -hmm. While I don't believe January 6th will be a major mm -hmm. topic in every race, there's two governor's races where suddenly the Republicans could have nominees with January 6 ties, Pennsylvania and Michigan. Mm -hmm. That, I would assume, is a problem. Yeah, for sure. There'll, there'll be ads there, for right. sure, uh, against the Republican. Um, but look, this is going to be a race primarily about inflation. I, I, I think you're probably right with maybe a little bit of abortion and guns as well. Yeah. I, I'm one of those who thinks we're really polarized. Turnouts could be higher than you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Daniela, Sarah, it's good to see you. It's nice to see you. Good while. I know. Glad to have you back. Uh, you're looking at live pictures right now out of Los Angeles. That's where President Biden is speaking at the U.S. hosted Summit of the Americas, where he's joined by other heads of state that chose to come to this meeting from across the region. They are about to meet to work on and adopt a new declaration on migration, which the administration says they hope will send a strong signal of unity within the Americas. All right, still to come. Putin, the great why the Russian president just compared himself to an imperial ruler who's been dead for nearly 300 years. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Russian President Vladimir Putin hinted yesterday that he may have further invasions planned as he compared himself to Russia's famous 18th century leader, Peter the Great. Putin told audience members at an event honoring Peter the Great that he sees the invasion of Ukraine as similar to the major European war and imperialism that Russia experienced under that ruler's leadership. Here's a quick bit of that. Петр первый Северную войну 21 год вел. Казалось бы там воевал с со Швецией что-то отторгал. Ничего не отторгал. Он возвращал в первых походах. Что что поделись тут? Возвращал и укреплял. So, what does all this mean? I'm joined now by Jeffrey Edmonds. He's an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and a former director for Russia on the National Security Council. All right. Putin's revisionist history is not new, and, and we know that. But it is important when he says these things to 
try to figure out, okay, he's saying these things, what does this really mean? This is what you do for a living. If he's comparing himself to Peter the Great and he sees this invasion of Ukraine means, what does this mean for us here in the West? So I think what it means is, is he has seen Russia as always being one of the central players in Europe. And that's, you know, ever since he came into power after, after the Cold War, he's been on this kind of trajectory of reasserting Russia in the same kind of role that, that, that Peter did, where you, know, you can't decide things in Europe without consulting Russia first. And he I wants think Russia to be European, but not westernized. Is that correct? Fair? Okay. Correct. He wants Russia to be a deciding factor in the, the security architecture of Europe, um, period. It doesn't matter if, if Russia is westernized. He doesn't want to be westernized. But he just wants to control and be a central player in Europe. So there's his ambition, and then there's the reality of what he can do, right? right. It's obvious he doesn't have the army to, to, to do what he wants to do. But he's got something that we don't always have in this country. He's got time. He does have some time. Um, but when you look at the, the losses that Russia is incurring in Ukraine, and not just in Ukraine, but all the economic impacts, the young tech-savvy people that are now leaving Russia in, in droves, he's really set them back. You know, a lot of us military analysts think that at least the Russian military will take the better part of a decade to recover from this. Mm -hmm. And the other long-term effects on this will, will probably outlast him. So it's not clear that he has enough time to actually accomplish any of the things he's talking about. When are we going to see the economic impact hit Russia to the point where it actually starts to impact their ability to wage this war? I think that's going to be a while. I think a lot of the stuff they're using to wage the war now they've had and they can continue to do. I'll be honest, I'm a bit surprised that we haven't seen more impacts yet. I anticipate them happening earlier. But I think the longer this goes on, the longer inventories in Russia start to dwindle, I think that your average Russian citizen is going to start feeling this much more. From the context I have in Russia, there's, there's this kind of thought like, well, this is only going to last for a little while, kind of like Crimea. Right. And I don't think they understand how long the impact is going to be on, on the Russian state. You know, if you just looked at the headlines of the war this week in Ukraine, you'd say that Ukraine's had a pretty bad week. Right. Uh, that it looks like Russia's making, uh, continues to make progress in the east. Is that a fair assessment? I would, I would classify it as, going, as, as give and take, right? So you'll see the Russians, they'll, they'll prep up, they'll conduct an offensive operation. They're only gaining like two kilometers a day or so. And then we expect them to move further, and all of a sudden you get a Ukrainian counterattack and they start losing territory. So while they're fighting better now than they did mm -hmm. at the beginning of this conflict, they're doing so with a broken force. And I don't think they can actually achieve even their revised strategic aims. There is a growing group of Western diplomats that are trying to figure out how to tell President Zelensky, you're going to have to give something. He's not ready to have those conversations. Is that how you see this ending? I don't. And I don't think we should be pushing him to, to end anything right now. I, in one sense, it looks like we're approaching a frozen conflict, right? And you hear that talked about a lot where both sides are in a stalemate. That might be true down the road, but this is still a very dynamic war. And it's not clear to me the Russians can actually achieve what they want to achieve. The Ukrainians have a national mobilization program. Mm -hmm. they, when they do retreat, they retreat in an orderly way. They regroup and they counterattack. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to continue seeing this through because it's not clear to me at all the Russians can, can do what they want to do. All right. I may ask a question almost from the opposite point of view, which is, are we going to look back and regret what we didn't do earlier? Are we going to, is the West going to regret not nipping this in the bud? I don't think so. I think, okay. well, one, I, I don't think there was any way to deter him from doing this. Sometimes you just can't deter somebody. And I don't think we could have done that here. And I think we responded in the right way. I think everybody, both in the West and in Russia, were surprised at the level of solidarity that, that Europe and, and the United States had in punishing Russia for doing this and all of the, the weapons we've provided. I mean, it's pretty staggering when you think about it. So I think, actually, we, we did the right thing. I think we approached this conflict the right way. Jeff Evans, appreciate you coming on. It's been a, a very insular week here in Washington about what happened on January 6th, right. but we cannot lose sight of what's happening uh, in Ukraine. So thank you. Thanks, and thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back Monday with more Meet the Press. Now I'm excited to say on Monday you'll see my friend and colleague Kristen Welker in the anchor chair. She's the NBC chief White House correspondent. She's my partner in primary nights on the Meet the Press election specials. And now she's going to anchor this show Mondays and Tuesdays. I'm ecstatic about this, and we're happy to welcome even more of Kristen on the Meet the Press team. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC News station. Wherever you get NBC, I'll see you then. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson after the break. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.